The word cerebellum translates to little brain. Not because it's the brain of a tiny animal or baby, but rather because the fact that the cerebellum looks like a smaller version of the human cerebrum. Very simply, the cerebellum assists with coordinating and adjusting voluntary movement. It plays a major role in posture, balance, maintenance of muscle tone, and coordinating skilled voluntary motor activities, things like riding a bicycle, or, for the more adventurous, walking a tightrope. In order for the cerebellum to undertake these functions, it has to be in constant communication with the cerebral cortex. It also sends and receives signals to many other structures in the central and peripheral nervous systems, processing information about current movement and positional states in order to help refine, correct, and improve the motion. Now, the cerebellum sits in the posterior part of the cranium, called the posterior cranial fossa, and it's covered by the tentorium cerebelli, which separates the cerebellum from the occipital and temporal lobes of the brain. Anterior to the cerebellum lies the fourth ventricle, pons, and medulla oblongata. Just like the cerebrum, the cerebellum consists of two hemispheres. These two hemispheres are connected by a narrow ridge in the middle called the vermis. From an inferior view, parallel to the vermis, there are two distinguishable lobules called the cerebellar tonsils. The cerebellum can be divided into three lobes the anterior lobe, the posterior lobe, and the flocculonodular lobe. From a superior view, we can identify the anterior lobe, functionally referred to as the spinocerebellum, which is responsible for the regulation of muscle tone and adjusting ongoing movements. Posterior to the anterior lobe is a V-shaped primary fissure. From a superior view and posterior to this primary fissure is the posterior lobe functionally referred to as the cerebrocerebellum, or pontocerebellum, which contains a horizontal fissure, separating the superior and inferior surface of the cerebellum. The cerebrocerebellum is the largest part of the cerebellum, and is responsible for assisting in planning and programming of skilled or fine motor movements. Looking at the cerebellum from an anterior view, the posterior lobe is bounded by the posterior lateral fissure. This fissure separates the posterior lobe from the third lobe of the cerebellum, called the flocculonodular lobe, or functionally referred to as the vestibulocerebellum. The flocculonodular lobe is responsible for the maintenance of posture and balance. The flocculonodular lobe is named such because it contains a central part of the vermis called the nodule, as well as two lateral flocculi. If we continue to view the cerebellum from the anterior aspect, we can see bundles of dense white matter that attach the cerebellum to the brainstem. These white matter stalks are called cerebellar peduncles and consist of superior, middle, and inferior divisions. They contain efferent and afferent axons that signal back and forth between the cerebellum and the central nervous system. The superior cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum with the midbrain, the middle cerebellar peduncle connects with the pons, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle attaches to the medulla oblongata. Afferent fibers to the cerebellum can be found within all three cerebellar peduncles, but the majority of afferent signals use the inferior and middle peduncles for passage. Efferent signals from the cerebellum, however, travel mainly through the superior peduncle. On a sagittal section, the cerebellum looks similar to the cerebrum, in that the cortex is folded, creating ridges with small sulci in between. The difference, however, is that in the cerebellum, the cortical ridges are thinner, smaller, and organized into more parallel layers, which are called folia. These folia not only increase the surface area, but enable the large area of cortex to fit into a smaller space, just like the cerebrum. The folia contain an external gray matter layer, called the cerebellar cortex, and a subcortical white matter region deep to the external gray matter. As we see, the shape of this white matter within the folia creates a tree-like arrangement, or branching pattern, referred to as an arbor vitae, or tree of life. On a transverse section of the cerebellum, we can see four clusters of deep gray matter nuclei buried deep within the subcortical white matter. These deep cerebellar nuclei, or intracerebral nuclei, 
contain multipolar neurons that receive signals from the cerebellar cortex and other parts of the nervous system, and their axons contribute to the formation of the three cerebellar peduncles. From lateral to medial, these deep cerebellar nuclei consist of the dentate, emboliform, globose, and vestigial nuclei. To remember these, remind yourself that in order to have a healthy cerebellum, you don't eat greasy foods. In addition to having anatomical divisions, the cerebellar cortex can also be divided into three functional regions that are positioned longitudinally. The most lateral and largest functional region is the lateral zone. The lateral zone sends signals to the dentate nucleus, the largest of the deep cerebellar nuclei, and together they assist in planning and programming movements. Medial to the lateral zone is the intermediate zone, also known as the paramedian or paravermal zone. The intermediate zone sends signals to the emboliform and globose nuclei. Collectively, these two nuclei are known as the interposed nuclei and are usually referred to together as they both work in the intermediate zone. Finally, most medial and occupying the cortex of the vermis is the third functional zone, the median or vermal zone. The median zone will send signals to the vestigial nucleus, which is the most medial of the deep cerebellar nuclei, located within the vermis and next to the roof of the fourth ventricle. The intermediate and median zones, along with their deep cerebellar nuclei, are involved in modulating motor execution of lateral and medial descending motor pathways, respectively. Let's take a quick break and see if you can identify the lobes of the cerebellum, as well as the functional zones and deep cerebellar nuclei. Now let's have a look at the afferent pathways, which bring information to the cerebellum to be processed, and the efferent pathways, which leave the cerebellum to help coordinate motor activity. Afferent pathways generally originate from the spinal cord and brainstem, the cerebral cortex, and the vestibular system. Starting with the afferent pathways from the spinal cord to the cerebellum, Let's look at the ventral or anterior spinocerebellar pathway first. It carries proprioceptive information from muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and joint receptors of the lower extremities. Then, the afferent fibers enter the spinal cord, where they synapse with spinal border cells located in lamina 7 of the spinal cord gray matter. From here, the majority of these axons cross to the contralateral side of the spinal cord, and form the ventral spinocerebellar pathway, which ascends in the white matter of the spinal cord to the brainstem. Here, the axons cross back over and enter the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncle to reach the cerebellar cortex. The signals on the ventral spinocerebellar pathway cross over the neural axis and then cross back, so it's often referred to as a double crosser. Next is the dorsal, or posterior, spinocerebellar pathway. This pathway contains fibers that receive proprioceptive information from muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and joint receptors mainly found in the trunk and lower extremities. This information enters the spinal cord from peripheral nerves and the signal synapses on Clark's nucleus, or Clark's column, also known as nucleus dorsalis. Instead of crossing over after they synapse, the axons ascend in the ipsilateral white matter of the spinal cord to the brainstem, where they then enter the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle to reach the cerebellar cortex. The final afferent pathway that carries proprioceptive information from the extremities is called the cuneocerebellar pathway. The axons in this pathway receive proprioceptive information from muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and joint receptors within the upper limb and upper thorax. Signals within this pathway synapse in the external or accessory cuneate nucleus located in the medulla. The axons travel ipsilaterally through the inferior cerebellar peduncle to reach the cerebellar cortex. Let's now move on to the afferent pathways from the cerebral cortex to the cerebellum, which include the corticopontocerebellar, cerebro-olivocerebellar, and cerebro-reticulocerebellar pathway. Talk about your tongue twisters. Okay, now these pathways, originating in the cerebral cortex, 
signal through brainstem structures to reach the cerebellum and allow for these areas to communicate to further regulate and modify voluntary movements. For example, the initiation, planning, and timing of motor activities. This information is important to the cerebellum to know so that it can take part in making the appropriate adjustments and modifications to that plan for synergy and overall motor coordination. The corticoponto cerebellar pathway is important in relaying motor commands of the cortex and begins with the afferent fibers arising from the cerebral cortex of the frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe. These fibers signal through the corona radiata and internal capsule to synapse on pontine nuclei. Then the signals are sent along transverse fibers, called pontocerebellar fibers, that cross over and enter the middle cerebellar peduncle to terminate in the cortex of the contralateral cerebellar hemisphere. The cerebro olivo cerebellar pathway also begins in the cerebral cortex of the four lobes and sends its fibers through the corona radiata and internal capsule, where the fibers synapse in the inferior olivary nuclei. After synapsing, these fibers cross the midline and travel through the inferior cerebellar peduncle to synapse with the contralateral cerebellar hemisphere. The cerebro-reticulo-cerebellar pathway also arises from the cerebellar cortex, however, mainly from the sensorimotor cortical regions associated with the parietal lobe. The axons descend in the same way as the previous two pathways and synapse with the nuclei of the reticular formation located in the pons and medulla. These fibers then travel through the middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles to terminate in the cerebellar hemisphere of the ipsilateral side. Finally, the last major system to provide afferent information to the cerebellum is the vestibulo-cerebellar pathway. It plays a key role in the maintenance of balance, posture, body position, and coordination of eye movements. This pathway begins by receiving sensory input regarding motion from the semicircular canals of the inner ear, as well as body position relative to gravity from the saccule and utricle via the vestibular nerve, a portion of the vestibulocochlear cranial nerve. During their course, afferent fibers of the vestibular nerve either signal straight through the inferior cerebellar peduncle to the ipsilateral cerebellar cortex, or they synapse first in the vestibular nuclei of the brainstem before signaling to the cerebellum. Together, these afferent fibers reach the cerebellar cortex of the flocculonodular lobe to be processed. The vestibulo-cerebellar pathway gathers visual input as well. These afferent fibers originate from the superior colliculus and the primary visual cortex, and the visual information is relayed through the superior cerebellar peduncle to reach the flocculonodular lobe. Okay, now that was a lot to take in. Let's take a quick quiz and see if you can identify the afferent tongue twisters, I mean pathways, from the brain to the cerebellum on this image. So now that we've discussed the major afferent pathways of the cerebellum, what does the cerebellum do with all of the information it's received? Well, the cerebellum processes this information, and the cerebellar cortex relays a movement modification message to the deep cerebellar nuclei, which then sends signals along different afferent fibers to places such as the vestibular nuclei, thalamus, red nucleus, reticular formation, cerebral cortex, and the spinal cord. In doing so, the cerebellum plays a continuous role in maintaining posture, balance, and modifying, adjusting, and coordinating movements of the body. The first efferent pathway we're going to discuss is a vestigial vestibular pathway, which is responsible for regulating extensor muscle tone. Fibers originate in the vestigial nucleus of the cerebellum and travel through the inferior cerebellar peduncle to synapse on the lateral vestibular nuclei. From here, some efferent fibers form the vestibulospinal tracts, which signal the motor neurons of the spinal cord that control anti-gravity musculature that helps maintain posture. 
Other efferent fibers will form the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which transmits information to the motor nuclei of cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 to modify and control movements of the eye. Another important efferent pathway of the cerebellum is the dentatothalamic pathway, which is responsible for modifying ipsilateral motor activity. This pathway begins in the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum, where fibers cross the midline and travel through the superior cerebellar peduncle to the contralateral ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus. The fibers synapse in the thalamus, and from there, the signal continues through the internal capsule and corona radiata to reach the primary motor cortex. Once here, the information is relayed to motor pathways such as the corticospinal tract, and this is how the cerebellum influences and modulates motor activity of descending motor pathways. Next, there's a globose emboliform rubral pathway, which also influences ipsilateral motor activity. These efferent fibers begin in the globose and emboliform nuclei, travel across the midline through the superior cerebellar peduncle, and synapse with the contralateral red nucleus. This pathway influences motor activity of the rubrospinal tract, which acts on proximal flexor musculature of the upper limb. Finally, we have the vestigial reticular pathway, where efferent signals originate in the vestigial nucleus, travel through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, and then synapse with neurons in the reticular formation. These signals provide modulatory information to the medial and lateral reticular spinal tracts, which collectively are involved in regulation of muscle tone and posture. All right, as a quick recap, the cerebellum is located in the posterior cranial fossa, below the occipital and temporal lobes, and ventral to it is the fourth ventricle, pons and medulla oblongata. It has two hemispheres which are connected by the vermis and is divided into three lobes. The primary fissure divides the anterior and posterior lobes, while the posterolateral fissure separates the posterior lobe from the flocculonodular lobe. From an anterior view, the cerebellum is connected to the rest of the central nervous system via the superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles. Looking at a cross-section of the cerebellum, it's composed of gray matter folds with white matter within that form folia. The four deep gray matter nuclei are the dentate, emboliform, globose, and vestigial nuclei. The cerebellar cortex can be divided into three functional zones. The median, which helps to adjust medial descending motor pathways that include those that act on axial musculature. The intermediate or paramedian zone, which assists in adjusting lateral descending motor pathways that include those that act on appendicular musculature. And the lateral zone, that works on planning and evaluating movements. Major afferent pathways from the spinal cord to the cerebellum include the ventral spinocerebellar pathway, the dorsal spinocerebellar pathway, and the cuneocerebellar pathway. Major afferent pathways from the brain to the cerebellum include the corticopontocerebellar pathway, the cerebro-olivocerebellar pathway, and the cerebro-reticulocerebellar pathway. The vestibulocerebellar pathway gathers information from the semicircular canals, inner ear, superior colliculi, and primary visual cortex to help maintain balance, posture, body position, and coordinate eye movements. And finally, the efferent pathways from the cerebellum include the vestigial vestibular pathway, the dentatothalamic pathway, the globose emboliform rubral pathway, and the vestigial reticular pathway. Helping current and future clinicians focus, Learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.